Hi, this is Scott Wilkinson, host of Home Theater Geeks. In episode 202, I chat with Bob Shuline about the latest developments in his immersive binaural recording technology. So stay tuned. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Home Theater Geeks is provided by Cashfly at C-A-C-H-E-F-L-Y dot com. This is Home Theater Geeks with Scott Wilkinson, recorded April 17th, 2014, episode 202, Getting Immersive. Hey there, Scott Wilkinson here, the Home Theater Geek and editor of avsforum.com. My guest geek this week is Bob Shuline, a sound engineer and developer of the Immersive Binaural Audio Recording System, which is what we're going to be talking about today. Hey, Bob, welcome back to the show. Scott, it's good to be back with you. It's been two years, and I <laughs> kind of missed it, but I've been following your show ever since, so nice to I talk really, to you again. I really appreciate that, and uh, it has been a couple of years, and uh, we, we talked about Immersive uh, AV, which you've been working on uh, for a while back then, but there have been some new improvements and additions, and and certainly there has been a, a resurgence, or a, a surgence, shall I say, uh, of interest in immersive audio and 3D audio, and this is something you've been working on and thinking about for a long time, so highly appropriate for you to be here again to clue us back in on immersive, and I must say it's pronounced just like the word immersive, but it's spelled I M M E R S capital A capital V. Very clever, I should say. Um, so, give us a give us a recap of the whole idea behind immersive audio, uh, the system that you have been working on. I'd be glad to do so. I think we've got a graphic that might help a little bit uh, as I'm speaking. Uh, sort of the, the the technical description is point of view. Uh, binaural audio recording with a with a high definition video picture, but it really is uh, uh, based on the synergy of sight and sound. Uh, we all know that we have many senses working, but if we can combine sight and sound, we we end up with a uh, a, a better impression of what was going on. Uh, I've got a little meme that the picture on the right uh, describes, which. Uh, I often say to people, and it's this, uh, picture a beautiful room, great acoustics, your favorite musicians are playing, and they invite you to come and hang with them, and there you are, and that puts you in an immersive experience. And you might say that the object here is to create, create those types of experiences uh, with uh, primarily music. Right. I love this graphic, actually, of a, of a really nice room and then a photograph of a string quartet sitting there and a photograph of you sitting there because those two things are virtual in your system. That's correct. Right. So, so tell us what, uh, what exactly is binaural recording? Okay. Uh, there's an interesting expression I heard some time ago, and it is most of what you hear in life is in binaural meaning most of what you hear is with two ears. Mm -hmm. And we all know from living in the world that by having uh, the two ears operating, we can detect uh, sounds from coming various places around us, behind us, to the sides, and so forth. So binaural recording is a mimicking technique using microphones that are typically placed at the uh, entrance to the ear canal. Usually the ear canal is occluded at the time to capture the sound that went on during a particular event. And then by playing them back through earphones and paying attention to the frequency response of the mics and the earphones, you create a binaural recording. The idea is quite old. Uh, I understand Yeah, it's that been around for a long time. I studied it in, in college when I was a physics major. I specialized in acoustics. And uh, I remember making some binaural recordings and, and being fascinated by it. And uh, this is, well, shall we say, more than 30 years ago. So it's been around yeah, so, for a while. You're right. Right. Matter of fact, historically, I think when the telephone was first invented, there was some French uh, 
engineers, perhaps, they went to an opera, they had two telephone systems, and they held the two mouthpieces right up where their head would be, and people at the other end with two phones heard a binaural experience. So that's kind of cute. Well, you know, I remember uh, playing with binaural audio way back when I was a physics major in college, which was, uh, shall we say, more than 30 years ago, uh, making recordings and playing them back and being very fascinated by it. Uh, give us an overview of what binaural recording is. Sure. Uh, there's an expression that I heard some time ago. Most of what we hear is in binaural. And that means that uh, in uh, the world we live in, we experience it with two ears. And these two ears with the brain working with them allow us to hear where sounds are coming from, side, front, behind, all these things. It's a pretty impressive uh, system we have with just two channels. And uh, so when it comes to binaural recording, the concept is to try to mimic that and uh, technically, it turns out that if you can put a microphone, a small microphone, essentially at the entrance to the ear canal, you can capture what you need to do to do essentially a perfect binaural recording. So once that signal is picked up, uh, stored, etc., then you play it back through earphones, pay attention to the equalization, you are making then a binaural recording which mimics the way we hear. So, uh, in other words, if you put these little microphones in your ears, or I think it's very commonly they're put into a dummy head with, with some sort of generic ear, um, outer ears called the pinna, uh, and record something and then play it back on headphones, you should be able to reproduce the directionality of where sounds came from in front of you, behind you, above you, whatever, uh, directly just by listening on headphones. Yeah, that is correct. And of course, uh, if we would use your ears or my ears or perhaps a mannequin's ears, there are slight differences between people when they are listening. And the differences are primarily in a little bit of tonal balance and also the uh, where you hear a particular sound. But being practical, uh, since we can't uh, customize this for everybody, uh, I tend to use uh, either a mannequin that I've constructed using some average ears, so to speak, uh, or myself or a few friends that have, have uh, proven to be pretty good in terms of typical. Mm. So it, 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 it is a compromise, but the, uh, the key elements of the uh, relative timing and amplitude of signals arriving at your ears uh, really are the driving forces be behind why it works. Mm -hmm. And this is the basis, really, of your immersive technology, what you're advocating the way we, we would record musical events, uh, concerts, uh, and so on, and, and play them back. And in fact, uh, I know that you've expanded your website pretty, pretty significantly to provide a lot of examples. And I want to make sure everybody knows about that, because we can talk about it till we're blue in the face, but you really have to experience yeah experience it. So uh, we have a slide uh, that, that can show people the, your, you know, the different websites that, uh, and the Facebook yeah. page, I think that you have. Um, right, right. So uh, we've expanded the, the, uh, the website and uh, it's a combination of examples and knowledge. Uh, YouTube tends to store most of the video we've created and uh, that is uh, fairly well organized now, so you can hunt through. And then uh, we uh, try to communicate with people through the immersive page on uh, Facebook, mm -hmm. uh, where we promote things that we've been doing and so forth. So right. uh, everybody likes to monetize things, and I would like to monetize immersive at some time, but uh, right now my feeling is that there's uh, so little knowledge about what we're doing that you basically have to make things free and easily accessible so that people can see what you can really do. And hopefully there's where the enthusiasm uh, starts and evolves. And we can right. talk more about this as we, uh, if we, as we go on here. Yeah, you bet. Now, we've been talking about binaural recording and headphones, and headphones make it easy to reproduce the binaural recording because they isolate each ear it's sort of like uh, st watching stereo or 3D video where you have to isolate the signal coming into each eye in order to perceive it. Uh, is it possible to reproduce a binaural recording on speakers out in the room and still get the same effect? 
Uh, I believe that it is quite possible, and that, that's an effort we started a few years ago. And uh, again, an old concept, it's called crosstalk cancellation, and the, uh, the functionality of it is sort of shown in this next graphic. So here's the situation. Uh, a DL and DR would be, let's say, the signals that were recorded uh, in the mannequin or the dummy. And what we'd really like to have happen with two loudspeakers here, X1 or LP1 and LP2, is to create that same result at the uh, person's ears where we have a virtual left and a virtual right. But of now, course, the two the sound from the two speakers mixes in the air between the speakers and the person. You are you are right on, Scott. The uh, and that's the crosstalk. In other words, the left speaker would uh, like to carry the left ear signal, but as it uh, radiates sound, both ears hear it, and the same is true for the right ear. So the the fact that there's crosstalk means that in order to change that, you have to get rid of the crosstalk, and hence the name uh, crosstalk cancellation filters. These two have been known and have been around for some time, but uh, I think we were in a very unique position as we developed this because we had a lot of binaural content to start with. So you could say, here's a binaural experience, put on your headphones, note where things are, now try your crosstalk filter listen with the speakers and how close do you come being you know, as, as far as being able to recreate that experience. And uh, that's been the refining process. Now, uh, crosstalk cancellation fillers are not trivial to do. Uh, one of the things that makes it difficult is you're trying to cancel things. In other words, the, the right speaker helps to cancel the left channel crosstalk and vice versa. And any time you make a sound with one speaker, it always crosstalks into the next. So there's sort of an infinite series type uh, action going on here with the filtering. And since you're trying to make things uh, disappear, uh, let's say to be uh, no crosstalk, you run into filters that tend to blow up uh, technically uh, because <laughs> you're trying to make things go to zero. And that generally doesn't work. So part now, of do you the, do that? Uh, now, do you do that by? Pardon me for interrupting. Do you do that by um, uh, generating an inverse phase signal yes. that that cancels uh, that, out, like sort of like noise canceling headphones? Same general right, that, principle. Yes, sir. That's that's a concept. And our filters were developed using MATLAB, which is t being able to take a mathematical equation that describes what the filter should do and realizing it. And then once the filter is done, you can pass the binaural signal into one end and receive the crosstalk cancellation version out the other. And as we iterated through that, we uh, discovered how to tweak things, so to speak. In other words, this, the theory takes you so far, and then you have to use some listening tests. Mm. Always. And we're very, you have to fall back on the listening, always. You betcha. So we've been, we've been very happy, and we believe that the examples that we've now posted on YouTube are, are good, good examples for people. Uh, a couple of them in particular involve uh, me walking around a mannequin. It was recorded in my backyard. And there is both the headphone version and the loudspeaker version. You can you can quickly find these on the website and on YouTube. Mm -hmm. And uh, the uh, the other thing that we've uh, gotten into has been uh, answering the question: What what are the loudspeaker requirements for crosstalk cancellation? Yeah, and, do some speakers uh, do some speakers work better than others at this? Absolutely. And within the last month, I've had occasion to uh, use some of the KEF UniQ speakers, mm -hmm. which uh, for those that aren't familiar with them, that's a speaker that is a coaxial design, highly refined so that the crossover is quite smooth. But the sound comes from one particular point. There's not a, not a disparency, be, uh, discrepancy, discrepancy between, the, yeah. say, the tweeter and the woofer. And... Right. Um, Kef being uh, in fact, there's in a, there's a picture of it for those who are right. watching the video. Right, and then if you look to the right, there's a a, a cutaway view of the speaker, 
And uh, Tanoi, I think, started this sort of thing many years ago. But the refinements they do. In fact, have been... In fact, let me just point out that, that for those of you who are watching this video and, and watching me, these speakers right over my shoulders are, in fact, Tanoi, uh, what are called coincident drivers, where the woofer and the tweeter uh, basically originate at the same location, which uh, is, it provides a more what's called a point source rather than having different drivers in different locations and having that sound, those different frequency ranges coming at you from different directions. Just wanted to point that out. Yes, right. In my old days at Sure, we had a Tannoy speaker used for microphone measurements because it had that unique capabilities. We didn't have uh, a double source, so to speak. It was all coincidental. So right. I, I became familiar with what they were doing some time ago. But anyway, uh, mo moving on toward this, um, uh, you can imagine then you've got a left speaker and a right speaker and these uh, signals are being fed to them. Uh, it's important that the speaker can create essentially the same sound field where your two ears would be if you moved your head out of the way. And you can measure that parameter on a speaker by making polar measurements. And I've been very impressed with the uh, Kef UniQ in that if you look at, let's say, the on-axis performance and you move say 20 degrees either side, these curves lay right on top of each other. And uh, when I listen to examples, I've been very impressed with the uh, localization capabilities. Uh, you can reliably move sounds behind you with just two speakers. Uh, other speakers that I've used that are more traditional don't do as well. They, they do well, say, out to 180 degrees or so, but tend, tend to fall apart then as you go behind. So mm -hmm. very impressed with this, and I, and I believe there's a number of speaker companies that are doing similar. I think Teal has something like this. Uh, I don't pretend to know all of them, but it's, it's something that I think was good uh, it's, that Kev started some years ago. Right. Got a couple of questions in the chat room real quick for you. Um, sure. uh, SoundPro69 says, one experimental way of achieving crosstalk cancellation would be reproducing the ambiophonics, I think maybe ambiphonics, with a physical baffle divider. But <laughs> yeah, you could do it that way, but it, it's not very practical. <laughs> Yes, there is a uh, very detailed AES paper by someone that maybe will be on your show one of these days, Don Keel. He's a renowned speaker designer. Oh, and, I'd love to uh, get him on, yeah. He experimented with this type of thing uh, some time ago where started with binaural recordings, played the left and right through um, two speakers, and then put a baffle between the two with sort of a cutout for your nose and chin, and you could uh, put your head up to that, and that was the crosstalk canceller. <laughs> and I, 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 I never had a chance to try it, but I understand it worked quite well. A little bit on the impractical side. It's yes. very much like like the uh, stereoscopic viewers that uh, that uh, our grandparents or parents had, where right. the, uh, the, the the images were separated that way. But right, yes, exactly. that's a, that that works well if you can tolerate the uh, inconvenience. <laughs> now, here's a question from Lawn Dog. Uh, if crosstalk has been a part of the normal stereo experience, uh, you know, we, we've been listening to stereo for how many years? Uh, almost 100 years, maybe, or certainly almost that. Uh, since the tube amplifier days, why is removing crosstalk or crosstalk cancellation, uh, why is that desirable? Okay, let's start with uh, what we're trying to do with stereo recording. In stereo recording, it's given that you're going to use two speakers. So in the production side, you have two speakers. Now the program is put together to sound the way the recording engineer and producer want it to sound with the two speakers, with whatever crosstalk is there. So that's just uh, the way it is. Now, and we still you, do get some some measure of imaging and uh, the sense right. that this instrument's over here and that instrument's over there right, or yeah. whatever. Right, and that's one of the reasons why typically when you're listening to two loudspeakers, the image width doesn't generally extend much beyond the, let's say, 60-degree included angle. Mm -hmm. with, the, with the crosstalk cancellation, your goal is different. Your goal is to take a recording that's supposed to be isolated left and right and make it that way with speakers. Mm, so gotcha. it, it's as if you could take the speakers and swing them around like a pair of big earphones. <laughs> but the idea is you don't do that. 
Right, right. I did. I did see once at a at a at a head show, head fi show, uh, about headphones, a uh, pair of, pair of headphones that were actually speakers, little speakers that w weren't in ear cups, but they were sort of sitting out from the ear while it looked really weird. Um, yes, and I would think there'd even I, be some crosstalk with that if you weren't careful. Well, there, I suppose there could be. I think. Uh, uh, AKG made a product. I don't remember the model number. Maybe someone in the chat room does. It was basically uh, a, a band that went over your head and hung to, call them earphones, call them speakers, so that they didn't cover your ears. And I think part of it was to uh, remove some of the effects of having something touching your ears when you're listening with headphones. Uh, so that could be somewhat what you saw. Mm -hmm. And my, I think it was AKG now that you mention it. Uh, Sound Pro 69 follows up by saying, I've, and obviously from his screen name, he's a sound professional. Uh, I've tried that with conventional multi mic recordings, adds back some spaciousness. The issue of, he wants to, he brings up the issue of double passing the signal through the pin A, the, the outer ear, uh, the mm -hmm. dummy head, in the dummy head or the mannequin head, and then again through the listener's ears, sort of is like a double filtering. Um, okay. Effect. All right. Well, uh, there's a part of the crosstalk uh, canceling that I didn't mention. Uh, it involves also a filter function of the head related transfer functions of a person or a dummy for the angles that the loudspeakers are to your head. So uh, if we start with the binaural original, all the body effects were in play pinna, head, neck, shoulders, and so forth. So right, because the sound that, diffracts around the head in, in, right. and, and gets affected by what's called the head-related transfer function, or HRTF. Right, right. So in the crosstalk cancellation filters, you are using knowledge of those head-related transfer functions to establish the same pressure at the entrance to the ear canal that would have been there if you were in the, in the original recording. So it, it doesn't really... Uh, even though the the uh, the pinna is in effect, the filters that are used uh, tend to cancel it out, so it's not double. Got it. Got it. Um, so we've talked something about the uh, loudspeaker characteristics that are helpful. In particular, a coincident driver setup like the Kef UniQ or the uh, Tannoy. Um, I forget what they call it. They have some name for it. Uh, what about headphones? Are there any particular characteristics that work better, work, types of headphones that work better than others? Well, that's that's a very good question. I think we've got a graphic, too, that uh, on, I think on the left-hand side shows a few different headphones. But uh, this, this has taken me down a number of paths. So let's start with the tonal balance, the tonal balance of the headphones. Uh, I think you may have had uh, Sean Olive on at one time, or at least ref reference some of the work he did. Mm -hmm. But uh, Har Harmon has done some good work directed at the question, what should the frequency response of the headphones be? And uh, they're, uh, in, in summary, what they did is they said, well, let's, let's establish a situation where we have a good sounding situation with loudspeakers. And then let's go ahead and put uh, probe mics in people's ears and measure what the sound field is at the, at the eardrum. Mm -hmm. then, they said, then they said, now let's take some earphones of, you know, just start with something you think is pretty good, which means they probably have the same response in both ears. Put those on people, feed the same test signal in and see what we get at the eardrum and they see differences. Then they say, let's correct for those and see what people think preference-wise. And they have about three papers that have appeared in AES that dealt with all of that. And uh, basically the, the sound field for the speakers and the sound field for the headphones are approximately the same. And uh, you, you might uh, uh, describe the headphone response as picture a flat response first. Then there is a boost of about 10 to 12 dB, somewhere around 2 to 3 kilohertz to, to account for the uh, canal resonance that's normally there. Then there's generally a, a bass rise, maybe 6 dB or so at uh, 100 hertz. Uh, and then the, the high end extends out to uh, 10 kilohertz with, with, with a little roll-off. 
this is generally what, what is found to be uh, considered a good response. But we do know that there's no real standard because um, there's no standard in place in, say, recording. If we did have a subjective sound field standard, then we could move toward a, a standard uh, loudspeaker response and a standard headphone response. But until this happens, uh, we sort of have to rely on uh, good engineers, good listeners, and well-produced program. So getting back, though, to your question about what headphones have I found to work well, mm -hmm. uh, I've, got th I've got three examples there. Uh, all of these headphones uh, in, the, in that slide that uh, John just had up, all of these headphones match quite well left and right ear. Okay, uh, if we you slide would, over you, to the slide over to the yeah left kind of side and down a little bit. Yeah, yeah. there right. we go. Okay, so I, I've got three styles. The, the The upper one is an insert earphone made by Edemotic Research. Uh, that's an ER4P that uses a. Uh, 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 variable reluctance type cartridge. The other two use uh, moving coil uh, cartridges or, or diaphragm speakers made mm -hmm. by Sure. The one on the left is called an open back or an open air, whereas the one on the right is a closed back. And uh, between those three pictures, you cover most of the styles of earphones. Uh, the, the, key, the common point between those is that the frequency response between each ear is very much the same. So this helps with uh, localization accuracy uh, and imaging. Let's, let's say, for example, you had an earphone in which uh, uh, left versus right, there was a, a peak in response uh, in the left ear versus a dip perhaps in the right ear. Now, if there was a sound in that frequency range, it would shift dramatically toward the left side or the right side. Right. Mm -hmm. So if they, if they match, then it's a sort of a neutral situation as to where the, the sound should come from. And that sound position should be determined by the program itself. So, uh, I, I like to think of earphones as there's there's the tonal balance element, which re really now is a preference. But the 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 mid to higher end earphones sort of fall in similar uh, similar uh, ranges. Uh, and then there's the, uh, the the type of earphone you listen to. For example, if you have a insert earphone. Uh, you have one advantage that the background sound, when the music is soft, is really low. So you can hear nuance better. Mm -hmm. At the other extreme, if you have an open ear earphone, open unless back, your room you is mean. open back, right, you, your, your uh, room sounds are going to mask uh, audio, the subtleties. So mm -hmm. that's, that's the type of a product that you really need to listen to where it's quiet. And, and you, the wouldn't, you wouldn't back. want to take those out. Uh, take those out to the gym, for example. <laughs> right, unless you wanted to hear the gym too. And then, right. then the clothes close back are uh, an example of uh, reducing some of that. And then, if you have a noise canceling addition, you can further reduce that. Uh, my preference when I'm doing editing and listening carefully is an insert earphone because I find uh, I don't really have to play it as loud because I can hear it softer for example, but it's, it's sometimes a little less convenient. So I sort of break the earphones down into those categories. There's lots of good ones out there. And I think most of the imaging differences are probably due to mismatches between the two sides. Uh, as you go up in price, the manufacturers tend to be much more uh, cautious and careful about matching things. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, so you were, you were going to, Tell us something about how, what you've learned in terms of production techniques. Uh, yes. And, and we, we have an interesting slide here of Brian McCarty, uh, who was a guest on the podcast about a month ago. You, in fact, introduced me to him, and I yep. thank you for that. Uh, right. And, and here he is in a, in a theater uh, with, I guess, uh, uh, little, little microphones in his ears, and you guys are doing some experiments. Tell us about that. Right. Uh, this slide really... Uh, demonstrates two points. Uh, one being how you can use immersive to make, let's say, recordings of some real world events, let's say from different positions. Like in this case, we're in a theater and um, we wanted to listen to some uh, repeatable film that we could produce 
Uh, the projectionist could start and stop it. So Brian sat in about five different positions in the theater. We also uh, got access, to obtain access to a, a, a visual image of what was going on. So then after the fact, you could uh, play this back through earphones, watch the picture, and in essence, move quickly between different places in the space. And... Uh, that is something we can talk about a little bit more when we talk about uh, cognitive dissonance. But uh, that's, that's a technique for, say, uh, answering the question, how uniform is the sound field in a theater or a mm -hmm. particular theater? Mm -hmm. Now, when it, when it comes to um, recording music, uh, the sort of thing that I found to be most interesting is uh, getting closer and getting the ensemble to be more uh, surrounding you or forming a semicircle uh, makes a big difference. Uh, you can probably find many binaural recordings that are made with a dummy head out in the, uh, let's say, the seating area. These generally I find to be rather boring because there's very little localization accuracy. It's sort of just like one big uh, mush of a sound field which I think is actually what you tend to hear in an orchestra hall anyway, but that's why many recordings aren't made that way. They're close mic and so forth. So what we found is that uh, we like to, uh, number one, get the musicians to first be able to play uh, with an ensemble of balance, meaning they can hear each other well. And then uh, just like a mix engineer would adjust levels, we use a, a trained person, myself and a few others, to put our head into the scene and listen for what we think is a good balance and what we think is exciting. And often asking musicians to change levels or move around. And then once we found that position, we can put a mannequin at that point. Mm. And uh, that, that has worked very well for us. But I would say that the, uh, the, the public is used to hearing a lot of close mic things. Uh, particularly pop and so forth. So the more distant you are, the more uh, uncomfortable it might be, so to speak. Uh, but if you've got a space that has a nice reverberation to it and isn't too wet or too dry, uh, we find that we can, we can get good positions. We've been doing a lot of work with uh, public radio station WBEZ in Chicago, which happens to have a great recording studio, and we're actually working on a new podcast uh, about musicians and music there. And uh, we, we, the great thing is that you can get in there, you can move things around, it's quiet. They even have variable acoustics. They have uh, large panels that are either absorptive or diffusive or reflective. And it's been a great tool to uh, perfect this. And oh, then yeah. you make a recording and then you play it back uh, for the musicians and then they listen and they tell you what they think. And we also had the video. And uh, when I first started doing this, I had a very open mind as to what to expect. But musicians love this, and they all usually come back and say, this is real, this is natural, et cetera. So that's, that's been a big uh, incentive for me and the others working with me to keep doing this. So it, sure. it's, it's the... Uh, it's the challenge of finding more and more musicians and uh, well-known musicians and so forth to make mm -hmm. these recordings. It reminds me almost of uh, Mark Waldrop's and others' uh, work in a surround recording. They, uh, Mark uh, has been on the show a number of times and coming up again next month, um, where he mixes, he doesn't do binaural recordings, he does close miking, as you suggest, but in a good acoustical environment, uh, and then mixes it to surround and gives you the option, does several mixes. One is an audience perspective, as if you're in the audience listening to the show in front of you. The other is if you're sort of in the middle of the band. And that's what, what you've just described sounds a little like to me. If you have the band more or less in a semicircle around you, it's not what you'd expect to hear if you went to a concert. But you certainly have a lot more detail in the placement of the instruments and so on. For me as a musician, it would certainly be more engaging and I would really dig it. Oh, uh, you, you could say that the concert hall is a construct so that many people can enjoy the production. But if you had your druthers, you'd probably like the musicians to come to your living room or a suitable place and you'd hang there right with them. And again, that's what we're trying to do. 
So uh, we, we also find, and this is not just us, but envelopment is a very pleasing, comforting element of sound reproduction. And uh, Mark's work uh, to give you this uh, in, in, in the mix uh, uh, perspective, I think, plays to that point. He also gives you a, like a theater mix or a mix where you're outside of the, the operation. So he gives you a choice, which I think is a good idea. Scott, here's another example of a cognitive dissonance that I've observed over the years. Let's take this situation. You're at a, a social event, let's say a dinner, lots of people around. You outfit one person with a, a binaural recording package that consists of a, of a small earphone that will seal the ear canal with microphones on the outside. It's connected to a recording device that's that you can play the microphones back through the earphones. You adjust the level so that it's natural. In other words, it doesn't sound like there's any gain or loss. So the person uh, can confirm that, gee, it's just, I sound real. Everything sounds real. Now you make an audio recording for five, 10 minutes. People get up, they move around, they clink glasses, and then you stop and play it back. And the person invariably says, this is absolutely amazing. You're, you're messing with my mind. It's, it seems like there's been a time shift here of everything sound wise. And in that case, since you're in the same place, the sight, the smell, the touch are all close enough, you get a very good uh, impression of what was going on. But then if you would simply stop and go back, uh, say an hour later, listen at home, you would find that the, uh, the experience is nowhere near the same because you know that you're not there. The other uh, cognitive inputs are not there. So it falls apart more. So this right. is really says that, you know, the audio can be perfect, but unless you have some other inputs, the cognition isn't as good as it could be. Hence no, the, no. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, hence adding the video is one step. You could add 3D video if it became practical. I haven't done that yet, but I'm very interested in that type of thing. You could even you could even add smellovision if you wanted to. That, that's right, right. You could. <laughs> well, I do know that that Mark Waldrop uh, does include video with his audio as well. Uh, he even he shoots the band performing. Now it's not exactly the same as just sitting there in one place with a camera. He's got a multi-camera shoot, and it's like watching a sort of a, a video on TV while you're listening to the music. Are you doing something like that, or are you just? Uh, you say you're adding video to the audio to decrease the cognitive dissonance. Um, right. Are you doing it like from a single perspective? Yes. Uh, so far, um, we've, well, now we have multi-camera capabilities. But when I first started, when I didn't have multi-camera capabilities, I put myself in the position of saying, what would I be doing if I was watching this group? Uh, and I decided what I'd be doing is I'd be listening for solos and choruses. So with the camera, what I tended to do was uh, zoom in more for a, a solo and zoom out more for a chorus mm -hmm. to, to try to emulate, let's say, telling a story with picture and sound. Um, we've, been, we've been trying some other things where we, uh, like, say, change the audio perspective uh, with video. And we're not too keen on that. It, it's not what you're used to hearing. Most uh, video productions of music have an audio perspective that's fixed, but the video changes maybe every five seconds. I think if the vid audio perspective changed, it would become um, uncomfortable. So mm -hmm. it, it, it's, it's still a... Uh, uh, an experimental thing. Some motion I feel is necessary, uh, but it doesn't have to be great. Uh, there's some other things that we're getting into. Uh, one of the productions we want to do soon is to, uh, let's say we take a, a string quartet, uh, put binaural mics on each of the players and a, like a GoPro camera looking at what they're looking at and then record simultaneously all four parts and wow, then do it. And, and then a recording of the whole ensemble and then give you, the listener, the capability to pick what you want. I think this could be quite interesting, particularly That's for the really musician. really interesting. 
Yeah, you know, yeah. I, I'd be yeah. very interested in that, actually. <laughs> right. It also could be a teaching tool. You're a musician, I know. So learning how to play an ensemble is not that intuitive because you have to learn how to judge how loud you are relative to the other players. Yep. So that's a, that's a learned skill. So some of these yep. techniques could be uh, good for music education. Wow, that is that is a very cool idea. Put a GoPro yeah. on the top of the head of each of the musicians and and binaural uh, recording uh, microphones in each of their ears. That that's very cool. Yes. Uh, now I wanted to to touch base before we end with um, some of the other technologies that are out there. I mean, as I said at the beginning, immersive in the traditional spelling, audio or 3D audio is becoming very common, uh, both in terms of multi speaker. Uh, situations and also in headphone technologies. Uh, DTS has Headphone X, Dolby has Dolby Headphone. Uh, uh, Fraunhofer just announced recently uh, uh, a version of MPEG that, that is a 3D audio system. Have you had a chance to listen to these and what are your thoughts on those? Yes, again, we have a graphic that I think might help. Uh, uh, to uh, sort of separate what we're doing from what they're doing is we're cutting to the chase and making live binaural content by uh, by acoustic means. The uh, Let's start with Dolby Headphone because that was one of the technologies that came out quite a few years ago. Um, uh, for for some of your listeners or viewers, uh, they probably might have a either a, a receiver or they might have bought a video uh, disc, a DVD, I should say, uh, of a, a movie that had Dolby Headphone. What Dolby was doing with Dolby Headphone was the following. They had as uh, original content the multi-track or multi-channel audio. They used a technology which I'll call oralization uh, uh, which they, they obtained from a company called Lake, which uh, uh, was basically allowing them to take a particular sound, position it in space by knowing the head-related transfer functions related to that, and technically what they call convolve it with some room to make it sound like that particular speaker channel came from that point in a room. Then they would take all five or six or whatever number of channels they had, and they would uh, uh, make a two-channel recording of this, which would emulate what you would have heard if you had been in the multi-speaker setup. So that was an additional track that they put on these uh, DVDs. One example for those of you who might have it is called uh, Pearl Harbor. So you can go to the audio uh, uh, options and you can pick this. Now, hmm. what, what I found to be a bit disappointing was that when I would listen to this and compare it to the, the legacy stereo mix I also provided, my general impression was you couldn't sell me on one or the other. They were both nice, but there was no real thing that popped out at you. On the other hand, if you just listen to a channel identification cut where they did left front, center, right front, back and so forth really cool it, it really put things there uh, similarly uh, DTX has headphone X which is a similar type of system where they uh, in one hand create uh, a two-channel mix from multi-channel content and feed that feed that down to two channels uh, they had an app or they've got a couple of apps on uh, iPhone and Android that do that and my impression again was I can't I can't take one over the other. They both sound equally good or bad, whatever your choice is. <laughs> so the, the the conclusion I've come to it's the content, and I would also say for DTS their channel identifier, which is eleven positions, is great. It comes out just where you think. But the the nature of the mix they've chosen is sort of a, a big mishmash or a blur, to my thinking. And you know, it doesn't... I happened. To, I I did agree with that uh, when I heard the um, uh, Hans Zimmer score for Man of Steel. They he mixed that in uh, eleven channels and they encoded it in Dolby Headphone X. And right. I heard a demo of you know left front center right front blah blah right. blah, all very convincing. And then the Absolutely. score came and and it. It wasn't all that remarkable to me. Now, well, as you it, say, it, that may very well be the content, the mix, the, yeah, the way they did it, it. It's the content. That's that's my feeling, mm. uh, and so forth. Now, 
Uh, you mentioned Fraunhofer. Um, there is a standard uh, that is, I think, going to be finalized sometime later this year that really deals with this general subject. And uh, it's an MPEG standard, uh, and that means that it was what they call a consensus-based standard where various participants that had entries, and I have a graphic on this. Uh, yeah, that's in the upper upper left of the, uh, right. no, no, the, yes. the previous slide, or is it yeah. was it that one? That, that was the right slide. Oh, the slide. Sorry. My, my apology. Sorry. That, that's okay. Uh, what they did is they had a uh, spatial anchor, or, or this original, I think, which was a program that was um, multi-channel that was being processed by a system such as we've been talking about. And MPEG was interested in finding out which codec would do the best job of matching the original at the lowest data rate, which means then that you could you could scale up from that. And right. the things in it, uh, identified is uh, HEAAC at two data rates proved to be the winners, and those came from Fraunhofer. And you can see that there were entries from Dolby and there were entries from DTS there. That's that's the way the MPEG group works. So. What will come out of this after this uh, standard exists is there will be know-how for those companies that want to include processing like this in computers or laptops or notebooks, etc., where you can efficiently take, for example, I think it's up to 22 channels of discrete audio and convolve those into a uh, two-channel mix for headphones or also manage that for a uh, speaker system in your home. And uh, my general feeling is that this whole thing is going to sink or swim based on content. Because if it's not more exciting than, say, your legacy stereo, uh, there's no reason to uh, to go to this. And I think that's the challenge. And that's the challenge that we've been working on. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, you also have some observations on... Uh, perceptual audio coding, which is really what we're talking about here. MPEG, MP3 is an example. Uh, HEAAC is another example of perceptual right. audio coding, which it, it, somehow the, the goal is to reduce the amount of data, reduce the bit rate that's required to send the data uh, without affecting the audio quality. That's right. Um, I often point out to people, including myself, that if all, <laughs> if, if, if all the perceptual coded still pictures, motion pictures, television, and audio were to stop and force everybody back to what would be called raw, the world would pretty much shut down. <laughs> so, There's not so, enough bandwidth in the world for it all, is there? Right. So we have to accept the fact that we all enjoy a lot of audio and video and pictures that are perceptually coded. And I'm very thankful for that. You and I wouldn't be doing what we're doing today without it. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, the, 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 the thing that's sort of in the news these days that sort of ruffles my feathers is uh, the high-resolution audio buzz. Now, uh, uh, Neil Young's Pono product, which I have no complaints about, it, it's, I think it's a fine product, but what it represents is a, uh, a tool by which you can <clears throat> capture, or I mean download and playback, uh, uncompressed audio at very high data rates and bit depths. Uh, my gut feeling tells me that that's not what's missing for the world to enjoy, let's say, better audio. What, what's missing is a better appreciation for headphones, speakers, rooms. In other, the th in other words, the things that the audio content, uh, the, the uh, file, gets played through. Uh, and there's, this is an ongoing uh, point that people will argue about forever because it's hard to prove that you can't hear something, if you know what I mean. <laughs> True so, enough. So, so if, if you look at the MPEG committee, which again is a consensus-based standard group that's got the best minds from all, the, all these manufacturers, Dolby, DTS, Sony, you name it, that are, are free to, uh, and Fraunhofer, of course, free to uh, propose what they want, that group 
in addition to looking at the, uh, the codex, also looks very carefully at the listening test. So um, the, the last graphic, I think, or one of the last graphics we have is a sort of complex looking chart. If we can, John, if you I can find slide, that one. That's slide nine, I believe. Yeah, right. You can back out on that slightly. Uh, let's let's uh, sort of break it down. Uh, the, the horizontal axis is bit rate. The vertical axis is something that has to do with, does this really bother me or not? Because if you look at the minus four, it's, it's very annoying. And you look at, <laughs> the, at, at the top at the top there, that's very annoying. And as you go up toward the top, it says not annoying. And I guess you could say zero beans uh, doesn't bother me. Right. And, I, and, and I put a blue box around a couple of things. Uh, the lower blue box is an MPEG-3, uh, which if you look down, the, I think the bit rate is about 128 kilobits per second. Mm -hmm. So uh, w when that test was done, that that bit rate for uh, for MPEG three was considered slightly annoying. Well, well, MPEG three is a scalable uh, codec. It doesn't mean that's the only one. I think people sometimes forget that. So if you go up to twice the rate or things like that, you move up on that chart. And then the advanced audio codec, which followed MPEG-3, that is also about at 128 kilobits per second, not annoying. Now, the audio that I've uh, created that goes onto YouTube is AAC at 320 kilobits per second, which is off the chart here on the horizontal axis. It's going to so be in my, no way annoying. <laughs> right. So, so my contention is that if people would do some blind testing and, uh, uh, you know, unbiased listening to, uh, 320 kilobit per second AAC, which is commonly available, uh, for, uh, production, you're in a very good position, but I'm somewhat forced uh, to offer 24 bit 96 kilohertz because there are some people that for whatever reason, they just have to have that. And uh, my feeling is as an engineer, you've got to be aware of what the, uh, where these trade-offs are because without observing them, files get big, uh, people can't figure out how to play it back and all that type of thing. Well, certainly you're exactly right that there's an awful lot in the news today about Neil Young and Pono and high-res audio. Um, and and it's, it's a fascinating discussion. We have a, a post on AVS that I'll just mention here uh, asking the question, is high-end audio dead uh, or irrelevant? I forget the exact wording, but in any event, uh, it's generating a ton of discussion on AVS forum. So... Uh, I do recommend that people go over there and check that out and chime in because it's a very contentious uh, subject um, that we've just yeah. barely, barely touched upon here. Yeah, I would just like to add to that, Scott. Uh, another bit of my philosophy about what we're doing is uh, if you take a binaural recording that we make, and let's say we store it at 24-bit, 96K and so forth, that program can be enjoyed by a person with entry-level earphones or, you know, $5,000 earphones. Similarly, the crosstalk canceled version can be enjoyed by a person with uh, exotic $20,000 aside stereo loudspeakers or uh, cheaper speakers that go on either side of your uh, your computer. So we're trying to produce content that will allow people to support a high-end business. In other words, uh, all you have to do to get into high-end is buy the ancillary gear, ancillary gear, however you pronounce that. But, mm. uh, you know, the playback. So the, the content, it's kind of like phonograph records were before the advent of uh, digital audio. That media supported high-end audio and entry-level audio. And uh, so that's what we're trying to do. And I, and I One, think that uh, it's not dead. It just, it, it'll thrive all by itself. And, and this actually is a great point uh, that you made earlier, that it's not the uh, equipment or the uh, codec or anything like that. It's the content. And I think that we need to be reminded of that once in a while, that, that really content is the start 
the end, the beginning and the end of, of really what we're talking about here. And you can get better quality or less quality, certainly. But um, if you've got the content to take it, the most advantage of what you've got, then you're going to have a good experience, I, I would say. Would you agree? Absolutely. Uh, I would say that uh, each of us have some favorite music we like. And we can probably enjoy it listening to it on about anything if it's mm -hmm. the right thing. Right. Yep. And uh, that's that's true. Well, we've come to the end of a fascinating hour. I want to thank you so much for being here. Um, Bob Shuline, uh, inventor of Immersive at Immersive.com. That's I-M-M-E-R-S-A-V.com. Thanks, Bob, so much for being here. Thank you very much. It's been a pleasure talking to you, Scott, and uh, hope we can continue this in the future. You bet. I look forward to it very much. Uh, as I said, go to Immersive, I-M-M-E-R-S-A-V dot com to learn a lot more about Bob Shuline's uh, project and process. And uh, I'm sure you'll find links there to, as he said, all sorts of examples that you can check out for yourself about the, um, the value of binaural recording. You can find me, of course, at avsforum.com. You can email me at scott at twit.tv. And you can follow me on Twitter at htgeekscott, also at avsforum. You can also find previous episodes of Home Theater Geeks right here on twit.tv slash htg. Also on YouTube at youtube.com slash twit home theater geeks. Next week, my guest geek is scheduled to be a home theater legend, Eve Ferruja. Those of you who have been into this business for a while, or this hobby, I should say, for a while, uh, will know the name Ferruja. He was the guy responsible for one of the most common video processors used in products throughout the industry, and uh, you have undoubtedly seen the results of his work. Uh, more recently, he's been involved in bitrate reduction uh, with regard to video particularly, and how can we reduce the amount of bit, uh, the bit rate and the number of bits uh, per second that need to be sent and received in order to see a high quality picture related to what we've been talking about here today. So uh, it's going to be a fascinating discussion. We're also going to talk a little bit about his long and illustrious career. So uh, please do join us for that. Until then... Geek out.